So with that, um, we have half an hour um, to have dialogue, and I just want to announce a couple of fun books. I'm sure that will, you know, very easy to follow. Um, one is just mutual respect, um, no matter what is better than um, And also, you know, feel free to address individual speakers um, when you're talking. So please feel free to raise your hand um, if you have a comment or a question for a particular individual. Um, and we'll go that way. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for Jim. I, I've heard this criticism before that Telegraph Avenue is you know, following the BART line. Um, because I wasn't involved on the commission back when the routes were first considered, I, I'd be interested in understanding better why Telegraph Avenue was chosen, not simply because of the thoroughfare, but also taking into consideration the services that are already provided in that area. Um, OK. So um, there's actually a lot of parallel transit, not just uh, telegraph BART, but uh, telegraph parallels other bus lines. You know, a couple blocks away, we have College Avenue, and then Martin Luther King, Sacramento, San Pablo. It, it's really, if we were laid out on a flat plain, like Chicago or something, you'd have a radial system. But we, we, our urban area, at least the inner East Bay, is sort of a narrow strip. So everything's north-south. So it is, te it is technically true that if you're looking at a map, it's parallel. So the 51 is parallel to the 1 is parallel to the uh, uh, 88 and the 72 and to BART and everything else. But the interesting thing is those trunk lines that Robert mentioned, the five biggest, are all parallel to BART. So there's something about them that serves a market that BART doesn't serve. So for instance, the, the, one, the number one bus now has a ridership of about 22,000 people a day uh, today. Um, the, the 51 has a ridership of about 17 to 18,000, the same for San Pablo. It's that people, it's only parallel in terms of lines on a map, but when you look at where people get on, you can't walk to BART as easily. The two mile spacing doesn't, it's not conducive to it. So, it's more, what we're trying to accomplish is sort of like a, some kind of bridge between the express commuter rail type service and a local bus that stops every block. Um, other cities have tried to do this. Um, New York City has, with their subway, they have local and express service. Um, Muni has the Muni Metro, which has like a closer spacing um, than the BART. And this is sort of how we envision it as something as a midway type of service, you know, that captures people that are traveling a little bit further, that are a little more time sensitive, such as motorists. Um, so the way we selected it, the, the second part of your question was, there, we looked at, when we did our major investment study, we looked at uh, several parallel routes. So we looked also at College Avenue, and we looked at Shattuck Avenue. So College Avenue at that time actually had the higher ridership than Telegraph. So it was actually the best in terms of ridership and residential density. A lot of people live up there. Telegraph was chosen because it had high density, not as high as college, but high enough to support transit. It had room to do something on the road. And there was room to grow the adjacent land uses. And there was things in Oakland's and Berkeley's plans to do just that, to do mixed fill mixed use infill development. So along Telegraph, Oakland is probably more ambitious in that regard. But so that combination of factors said, well, tele the Telegraph portion is the one to go. And really, Oakland's redevelopment, the priority development areas, International Boulevard was their choice. We looked at Foothill Boulevard and San Leandro Boulevard, and they quickly realized International has the most people, the most infill potential for housing in particular, it had the commercial district that they wanted to support the most, transit-oriented commercial. So that's how we got those, a selection of the entire route. 